Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. This episode is sponsored by Rimmel Greenhouse Systems, makers of quality greenhouse structures. Whether you're just getting started or buying your 10th tunnel, Rimmel has a structure to fit your needs. I purchased and grown in Rimmel houses and would recommend them to everyone. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Blair Thompson. And Blair has spent over 15 years in a diversity of agricultural operations around the country before landing at Warren Wilson College. It was while working on these farms that he encountered Warren Wilson graduates and knew the college farm was turning out skilled and passionate land managers. He strives to build students into leaders who have an ecosystems approach to agriculture that focuses on building building farming enterprises suited to each landscape and community. Blair is committed to bringing the classroom into the field so crew members are able to ground their thoughts in the act of work and are prepared to take the lessons of the college farm into the broader world of food and agriculture. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so give us a little bit of uh, overview of uh, as your career through agriculture, what types of farms did you land on? Yeah, I, you know, the first farm I worked on and, and sort of where I kind of cut my teeth farming was in northern Indiana, kind of right on the Michigan border. They call it Michiana up there. Um, and the first farm I was on was um, just a very diverse, um, you know, market garden to uh, hay production to running a few sheep. And, you know, they were sort of young and getting started themselves. Um, and so it was a really fun and just like dynamic, uh, you know, sort of startup feel to it all. Um, and yeah, from there I sort of launched into, um, you know, the whole, that whole community of, um, folks and growers, more vegetables at that point in sort of where I was getting exposed to, but certainly had some animal and livestock exposure. Um, and that area also is, um, you know, quite rich with Mennonite and, and uh -huh. Amish farmers. And so um, it was a really fun um, sort of community to get to land in. Um, so that was really my first sort of uh, crack at things. I was there for four or five years in, in various capacities, raising some animals myself, uh, managing uh, farms, or managing sort of crews for other people. Um, and then from there, I, you know, ended up in Northern California um, working on a, one, both, both farms I worked on in, in California were nonprofit educational operations, um, and both were quirky and fun, really unique. Um, one right on the coast called Slide Ranch, and one further down just into the Santa Cruz Mountains called uh, Hidden Villa. Um, both of those, I was doing more livestock, uh, you know, everything from dairy goats and layers to, uh, you know, Farrow to finish pigs, um, lots of sheep, um, and and a few dairy cows along the way as well. Um, so that that's kind of my path before ending up here at Warren Wilson, I guess. Wow. So where is Warren Wilson College? Talk to us our, to our guests about kind of where it's located and, and kind of the program there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Warren Wilson is in Swannanoa, North Carolina. Um, which is really a, a, a very close uh, adjacent town to Asheville. So we're, we're in Western North Carolina. It's a very uh, beautiful and mountainous area. Um, uh, most of the agriculture up here is on small acreage. You know, it's kind of your classic Appalachian, um, you know, valleys and, and river bottoms where, where most of, if there is any cropping where that's going on. And then a lot of the sort of hillside farming is, is cattle. Um, you know, you'll find pigs, you'll find sheep, but you, mostly what you're going to find in this region is, is cattle operations just because of the landscape. Okay. And the program on the, the college, talk to us a little bit about, is it really focused on just ag or are there other um, areas that they, the college uh, focuses on? Yeah. And, and I guess that's really one of the super unique things about Warren Wilson. And one of the things that, you know, has me 
so excited about being here is is the model. You know, we're not um, we're not an ag school. We're a liberal arts college, uh, okay. and so with with all the you know typical and or or and sometimes atypical uh, liberal arts degrees. You know, we have a the college has a strong music program, a strong writing program, biology, um, and I'm sure I'm going to leave you know important uh, ones out, but it's it's a really you know rich mixture of uh, of program offerings. Um, but what makes us uh, sort of a unique in the liberal arts world is that um, we're what's called a working college. And so every student who attends Warren Wilson is expected to work um, on a work crew during their time at, at the college. And, and really one of the founding uh, crews and, and one of the crews that, you know, I still think highly of is the farm crew. Um, uh-huh. And so, you know, our our the students on our crew can be sustainable ag majors. We do have that major. We have, you know, an ag, ag, sort of agriculturally adjacent majors as well. Um, but you know, we have philosophy majors. We have math majors um, who are on the crew. So it, it's not a requirement to be on the crew that you you have some sort of ag focus in the classroom necessarily. Um, but the, the the college farm is. And I guess sort of stepping back from that, it, it kind of gives us a unique relationship to, um, you know, kind of what our work is. Then we're not we're not a research farm. Um, we're not. Uh, while there is some research that happens on the farm, and it is a landscape that you know is is we really invite folks and faculty to come use. Um, the the purpose is not you know sort of your land grant. Um, agronomy or nutrition mm-hmm. focus. We are we're really focused on um, having students who come through this program be able to you know take take their education whatever it was and be able to then translate that into farm management. And that's really what we're thinking about is um, you know how do you develop your leadership skills? How do you develop your your hard skills around agriculture? And then leave here with an ability to. Um, you know, manage either somebody else's or, your, or develop your own operation as you leave. Um, so we're not really a gateway into the ag industry as much as we're a gateway into, um, you know, finding your own sort of path or, you know, uh, sort of a, um, a different way, of, a different point of entry, I guess, into the food system and into ag than maybe some of the, the, the traditional land grants would offer. And because of that, we, we really work with some awesome students um, who, you know, have a unique uh, entry point themselves into this um, work. And some, a lot of students, you know, see the farm from afar during their tour and think that looks really cool. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And mm-hmm. some students, you know, find it organically. Uh, right now I have a, a few students who have come, you know, we have a pretty developed craft program at the college. And so I have some students who have come through the, those craft crews and thought, well, I really enjoyed sort of learning the, um, you know, either spinning and, and wool work or blacksmithing and that end of things. I'd like to see how that really applies in a, in a farm setting. Um, and so there's just really uh, a, a diverse uh, set of students who find their way here. Um, so once on the farm, you know, we do, we have a pretty high, uh, you know, re- set of requirements as far as um, what we expect from students. And we really want them to you know, learn what the work feels like and learn kind of how, what those seasonal rhythms feel like. And then as they're on the crew, really progress into crew leadership um, and, and really owning the, uh, the uh, operation for themselves. And so we put a lot of effort into, um, you know, making sure those pathways are clear, making sure they understand, hey, if you, if you put the effort in here, you know, these are the things you're going to get out of it. These are the opportunities that are going to come um, come to you. And, and it's really fun, you know, from, from a manager standpoint to get to watch students develop over the years and leave here just, um, you know, confident in their skills and, and really trust that they're going to be able to make a meaningful contribution um, sort of in the broader agricultural world because of their time here. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of interesting and unusual that a college has a work requirement. What is that, and how does that work for the the general student population? Yeah, it is interesting. You know, there's there's only a handful of work colleges out there, um, and so we have a there is a work college consortium, and we do try to you know kick those ideas around because it is such a such a unique and you know niche in a good way um, model. 
you know, the, the original conception and, and the reason that work program is there is because when Warren Wilson was established uh, by the Presbyterian Church, um, you know, there was no there was nobody to bring food out here. Uh, yeah. To, you know, it had to be produced here for the college. And so you could come to school here and, um, the, you know, as a sort of an outpost for the, the Presbyterian Church. And then you didn't have to pay as long as you were willing to work to keep the thing alive. And so we, you know, clearly that's not the exact way our model works at this point, but that sort of spirit is the idea that, hey, we're a community that's here for each other. Um, you know, the work program uh, is something that you, uh, helps offset some of your tuition costs. Mm-hmm. Um, and while you can do the farm, we do have a really, um, really interesting set of crew offerings that you can be on, you know, everything from, you know, carpentry and electrical to um, farm, garden, forestry, um, landscape design, um, and uh, and then some more of the, uh, you know, like uh, administrative skills as well. Um, a lot of the uh, academic departments have a crew um, that either helps maintain labs or maintain, um, you know, uh, uh, artist space and things like that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways for students to plug into that program. Um, yeah. And, and it's sort of as unique as a student's interest is. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm looking at your farm in, uh, Facebook page, and you guys talk to us a little bit about the different um, enterprises on the farm. Yeah, so, you know, it is a very uh, diverse operation. I feel like I keep saying that word, but it, it's true. Um, you know, our we are uh, right about 280 to 300 acres. Um, and that's changed here recently. We had a, um, did a lot of, uh, re-meandering of some streams that were, you know, functionally, uh, you know, water drainage ditches around the farm and yeah. we had a group come in and, and re-meandered some streams through us. And that's been a whole project in and of itself. And it's changed, you know, the, how the farm works a bit and certainly hydrologically as well. Um, but, uh, about, uh, you know, 200 or so acres of that is hillside pasture and so we do have um a cow calf operation and we're finishing uh 50 to 60 um steers and heifers a year um we're direct marketing beef and then we're selling uh bred heifers either to you know folks in the community they're interested or um at auction depending on you know where the demand is that year um, we also have uh, a, a small but growing herd of Dorper sheep uh, that we're uh-huh. actually cross, crossing some new genetics into this year. So um, we're and they, you know, in some ways they share pasture ground with the the, the cattle, um, and we also do some grazing of s- smaller acre holdings with with them um, and some cover crop grazing on. Um, on some of the vegetable fields and that kind of thing. Um, and then we have a fair to finish pork operation. Um, and that is really fed by the other, I, I said, we have 200 acres of pasture. We, and then we have 90 or so acres of bottomland crop fields, um, where we grow, um, corn and a small grain in rotation with a, with a perennial forage that we finish beef with. Um, and that, um, the, the, Corn and, and small grain is used to feed our, our pig operation, as well as um, some uh, layers that we uh, raise as well. At this point, I think we're doing about 20 to 25 uh, sows and, and finishing 100 to 150 pigs a year. We'll sell some pigs to the community um, and then we'll direct market some. We have a, we have a really strong relationship with a local local butcher shop that buys um, at least four pigs a month from us, sometimes more, um, depending on where we are in our, our cycle of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, and, and of course, all those pieces have to fit together in a, in a constant dance. And so it's, uh, it's uh, fun, but, but tricky sometimes to keep all those balls in the air. Yeah. Absolutely. So this uh, stream restoration you did here, I'm looking at a picture of that. Um, and was that creating a whole new stream bed? It looks like you brought in stone and and then you re- you did fix the banks. Yeah, I mean, it was extensive. Uh, they, yeah. 
a couple a couple streams were so there was really there's multiple places where work was done there was two deep uh drainage ditches that you know were deep enough you could stand in them and not see out of those were both one was filled in completely and the stream was located you know relocated through a different uh low point in the in the field there and mm-hmm. one was uh filled and and sort of re-meandered um and and both of those um you know have changed the layout of the field in, in fairly significant ways and have also raised the water table in fairly significant ways and, and we're a really wet region um and so you know <laughs> we're we're constantly sort of relearning um you know where uh, how our fields work and, um, you know, how, how we can work with this sort of new layout. Um, it's been, I think, you know, as a whole, it's been an awesome net positive for the college. Um, I think agriculturally it has certainly presented unique challenges and opportunities that we're still sort of un- unpacking, you know, we're really only year two into the project being finished and then seeing how, how things work. And, and over the next few years, we ought to see, you know, some really significant, they, they've really planted those um, new riparian zones with a lot of new trees and shrubs. And as those come in, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of how that, you know, again, affects sort of how, how water is moving around in some of our fields. Gotcha. So the process of that, is that where they come in with and laser the field and kind of figure out where it should go and then work that through? Or is it more just where you think that it should go? How does that process look like? You know, it's a really interesting question. I it, and it's one of these projects. So I started at Warren Wilson in uh, January of 2020, and gotcha. as I was starting, that project was maybe three quarters of the way done. Um, and so I've kind of, you know, seen it. Had a but not good there. ongoing relationship with yeah. previous farm managers to talk it all through. But it, it's certainly something where I had to get up to speed, and I'm not exactly sure how all the uh, uh, decisions were made about where to relocate and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So do you guys, you do the, the cows, you do the, the sheep. Um, what about any other enterprises? Is there any vegetables or any other horticulture crops? Yeah. So we do I, on, so it's a little funny for the, uh, you know, non Warren Wilson community because we call the farm, uh, the farm mostly for internal purposes. There is not in any way the only agricultural enterprise that's happening at the college. It's just what this crew is called. So when we say the farm at Warren Wilson, what we really mean is the livestock and the row crops uh-huh. uh, okay. that are, go to the livestock. We also have a garden crew um, and the garden crew, uh, they have, I believe, around five acres uh, vegetable production. Uh, I don't think it's all in production every year. Um, as I was saying, we do uh, overlap with them by grazing and sharing some cover crop space. Um, we also have the forestry crew that does a lot of agro forestry type operations. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, they grow mushrooms in the woods. They, uh, actually we tap, uh, black walnut trees and, and make syrup with those. Um, and as well as sort of traditional forestry, um, uh, and then you have, like I said, like the landscape design and sort of maintenance of garden spaces around campus. So mm-hmm. there, there's lots of different, you know, land-based and agriculturally based um, enterprises happening around around the farm, around the college. And I'm sure I'm leaving out, you know, other interesting ones. But but the farm name is is really for um, the the livestock and the uh, the row crops. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Um, talk to us through a little bit. You talked about marketing a little bit where it goes. Does uh, a portion go to the dining halls? Do you guys sell right uh, feed the students? Yeah, we do. Um, so the main way we provide uh, food to the dining hall is through is, is through our coal animals. Okay. So every year we're you know removing uh, five to ten uh, old cows from the herd. And, and replacing them out of that year's heifers. Um, and so all of those coal animals go to the cafeteria, largely in ground beef and beef patties and some, you know, kebab meat and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then we'll also process a few beef um, of, for them as well, just depending on how many coals we had that year and, and what their needs are. Um, and, and similar with the, the pigs, we'll, we'll, when we call a sow, 
Um, you know, she'll end up being breakfast sausage for the cafeteria mm-hmm. or Italian sausage. And, and then similarly, we'll process a few pigs for them as well. Um, and so that's been a really uh, fun and, and interesting part of it is, you know, trying to make sure we're aligning our production with their needs um, and also meeting some of our other, you know, market demands um, where we are selling direct to direct to consumer or, or into restaurants and wholesale as well. Um, all, all of that also is run by students. And I guess, you know, just to reemphasize, like students kind of do everything. And so that mm-hmm. that is actually a position on the crew is is the meat sales manager. And so we have a student every year who, um, you know, we, we get them up to speed on kind of what our channels are uh, for marketing and sales and let them sort of run that. Hopefully they develop, you know, some new thoughts along the way and, and introduce a new enterprise or new wholesale account or two um, as they're working in that position. Um, and it's been a really fun way to, um, you know, get to share that uh, responsibility and knowledge with a student who, you know, um, really leaves with an interesting set of skills that maybe you wouldn't get from like your first farming internship kind of thing. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, so with, with the sales, then they're selling into the community some, um, what would you say like your, your biggest seller is on the farm? Um, I mean, the the pork is really the bit that is probably the profit driver. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it is, uh, as far as, you know, ability to turn over animals quickly, um, and, you know, keep inputs low, uh, that's, that's, you know, and it's, we have incredible demand for the pork. It's an awesome product. Um, we've kind of over the years, the farm developed a reputation for, um, having a nice, like regionally adapted mix of breeds. Um, and I think, you know, it really does show in, in our pork. Um, certainly beef is a big part of it as well. Um, and it's certainly profitable, but it's, it's harder to make money on, um, you know, those animals that are going to take two years plus to finish. Um, and, and they don't drive profit as much as, as the pork does. Um, and the lamb and the chicken are both sort of distant thirds and fourth. They're at this point, you know, I, they don't make a ton of money for the operation. And really, you know, while certainly having a fiscal bottom line is important to us, um, you know, certainly all the educational outputs is our main bottom line as well. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, Thriving Farmers, each year we are faced with two important investment decisions. We should be investing in systems that increase productivity and in inputs that develop soil. In December of 2020, I was introduced to a seed, soil, and foliar prebiotic treatment. This product is called Ultra. Ultra is an OMRI-listed prebiotic formula manufactured by AgriGrow. I have personally been running several trials testing Ultra on my farm. I'm impressed. Ultra increased our strawberry yield production by 18%. On a 900 square foot trial, $6 in product cost returned me $868 worth of marketable strawberries. We also had decade old heirloom corn seed that I've been trying to germinate with no success. In a Hail Mary attempt with my remaining few seeds, I soaked them overnight in a diluted solution of Ultra. They germinated. If you would like to try Ultra or any other agrigo product, I believe this would be a worthwhile investment on your farm. Here's the best news yet. AgriGrow has agreed to offer a 10% discount to all thriving farmer listeners. Simply use the coupon code THRIVE when you check out. Again, that is T-H-R-I-V-E for a 10% off discount on your first order. Head to smallfarm.solutions to order today. So then that's interesting that that's the driving. I mean, and that's across the industry is what I see is the pork really seems to be the one of the more highly profitable um, enterprises. And I think the other thing too is like if you look at how beef used to be raised. A lot of it used to come from the the far West where there's, you know, very low cost of production land is super cheap. And then that was brought into, you know, the stockyards in the Chicago area where it's processed for the East coast. Um, So I think that's just something we need to consider. And obviously we want to keep regional local food systems, but that beef is inherently because of its massive scale and need for land is never going to be as profitable as some of these smaller enterprises. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly the land requirements are real, and um, you know, there's just no way around that. Uh, one of the things I like to tell our students is, you know, I'll I'll put our uh, miles of perimeter uh, fencing 
per acre up against any farm in the country. We have, yeah. you know, this, these little Appalachian hills. Uh, we have so many, you know, little pasture here, little pasture there that adds up to 200 acres. And so, yeah, it's it's real, you know, that need for some uh, some sort of uh, land extensive land base in order to have a scaled enough operation to make it profitable. Um, because, you know, the, since the margins per animal are smaller, you really do need to have some kind of scale. You know, it doesn't have to be enormous, but some kind of scale in order to, um, you know, have a, yeah. have an income driven off of it. So I see on your website, it says 34% of food served on campus is grown and purchased locally or grown on campus, which is pretty awesome when you think about it. It is. Yeah, it's a really cool, there is uh, between the garden and us, and then there's a local foods crew that does some work with other local producers to get food into, um, you know, the cafeteria here. It, it is a definitely a focus and something, um, you know, that there's a lot of care and thought put into. Yeah, that's awesome. Talk to us through a little bit about, you know, the, the students that work with you. What's the greatest, I, I don't say, like enjoyment of your job of seeing, you know, the, the progression of their their skills or what, what do you really find is exciting about what you do? Yeah, I mean, I really, there's so, there's so many, um, you know, individual stories and watching students come along and, and they really come along at, um, at totally different rates. You know, I've had students that literally didn't know how to handle a shovel when they started here. And, and we've had students that were, you know, journeyman level uh, uh, welders when they started. And yeah. so, you know, folks just start at all different places. And yet it does seem like every time the farm has something to offer them, um, you know, maybe they'll just leave with like, hey, I can use a drill and I can dig a hole and I can drive a truck. And, and it just like gives me a huge sense of confidence yeah. to like yeah. have that. And maybe they'll leave and think, man, like I really put a bunch of, th- you know, we're, we're really trying to make a transition into no-till cropping right now. And so mm-hmm. the students are involved in that, hopefully, you know, they're just going to leave with saying, man, I was able to watch and, and help, you know, steer some of that transition and, and think through the implications of choices we make. So, you know, just getting to see them take those progressive steps and, and particularly, you know, like I was saying, we're thinking a lot about, um, you know, laddering up through the crew. So you kind of start with a, at a certain position and, mm-hmm. and, and we have, you know, written position descriptions for the students so they can really see, okay, if I'm here two semesters and then I move on to working on the cattle crew, so I'm always working with the cattle, and I put a few semesters in there and then I could become the cattle crew boss. Um, you know, here's what that's going to look like. Here's how those skills are going to develop for me. And, and seeing the students who do, you know, work their way through all those positions and then end up in one of these real senior positions. Um, you just can watch as they develop confidence, develop managerial skills, um, you know, start to be able to really have that systems approach of way of thinking about, you know, the whole operation and not just, you know, the discrete, each discrete skill along the way. Um, and, and, and it's just super satisfying and super fun to see them, um, you know, c- catch a vision for, for, you know, wherever their passion in it lies. I mean, that's part of it too, is there's just so many ways you could come about this agricultural thing. Um, and certainly I have my own story and my own set of things that gets me excited but it's not the same for every student and and knowing that they can have their own entry point and find a lot of meaning um and excitement in that is is really cool and you know whether or not every student goes on and is a farm manager um you know we're still happy to see them sort of progress and see and and get to learn some of those lessons that that agriculture has to teach Absolutely. Now, that's interesting. You said that they can kind of work their way along the way, the different roles. Do you have very specific, like you need to learn these X, you know, skills before you go to the next role? Or is it more like as they just seem to be able to manage more, they kind of generally move up? No, it's pretty specific. Uh, We try to, we try to make it as clear as possible what the ladder is. So, you know, and be that, you know, hey, if you want to drive the combine one day, uh, you know, why don't you start by learning to drive a stick shift? And, and we re- I mean, we literally have that built into a flow chart so that every student can see, like, if I want to do these things, how do I get there? We don't want it to be a mystery. Um, because, yeah, that, that transparency, I think, creates some motivation for everybody. Um, so, yeah, you know, generally, you know, you'll be, you'll kind of come in, you'll work on what's called general crew, um, and you'll just kind of get an overview of everything that's going on. Um, 
you know, and within that, you'll learn, you'll learn some tool skills, you'll, you'll learn some equipment operation mm-hmm. skills, um, and then you can decide, hey, I'd like to work over break. I'd like to work a summer. Um, and, and those are often, you know, uh, entry points into some of the more leadership, either positions on that general crew or into one of these animal crews where you really, the animal crews are run by a student. So there is a student mm. boss who is in charge of, um, you know, the cattle operation, in charge of the pig operation. And, and so that, that student boss reports to us. And, and we, while we, you know, are present and helpful and, and communicative with the members of their crew, it is their crew. Um, and, and so they manage the day-to-day reality of that crew. Um, and so each of those, you know, steps along the way, um, you know, we're really talking with each student, what are your goals? What do you want to get out of your time here? Um, you know, at the end of, and beginning of each semester and really trying to be intentional about how they're going to progress um, mm-hmm. during their time, time at the college. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love the fact on your Instagram that you show a lot of different aspects of the farm. Um, like you're just showing like a recent post was the foot bath you did for your cows or sorry, your sheep. And obviously on one aspect, it's kind of a little people, there's some comments, well, that is sick. You know, it's not very cool, (laughs) but I, I actually think it's really interesting to see kind of how you have that set up. Um, but the fact that you're showing that is showing real agriculture. Yeah, I mean, that really is the point. And I have to give credit. I'm not the social media person I, I work with, um, a great uh, former student, Sienna, who uh, she really manages the Instagram, but she, I know she thinks, and we talk a lot about, Hey, are we, how are we, what are we using that platform for? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, are we making sure to, uh, we really, we want to use it as just another educational tool. You know, it it is not, um, you know, necessarily to generate more followers if it does fine but it really is we want to think about it as like hey this is a very specific part of what we're trying to do is put out some practices that we're using um make sure we're adding to a conversation for for producers and and Mm -hmm. for our students to get to see um you know what are the specific things because and and i guess we haven't touched on this yet but even though we are certainly focused on our students and that kind of thing we do want to have um an ability to uh, serve the producers in this region and, and be able to try out things, um, you know, bring in some new practices that maybe um, are not fully uh, regionally adapted yet and, mm-hmm. you know, think, th- help, help be a, a resource um, as well. And so that's really what that, that account is for is to, you know, to help um, lend its voice to that conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome that you're able to do that as well. Um, it, it's also, I think, really, I, I think the biggest thing, like, let's see, even if a student just comes through the college and ends up on the farm for a little bit, they may not, you know, go on to be a farmer, but they now know about sustainable agriculture and just understand how hard work it is, um, some of the tenets of sustainability, and hopefully just what a good day's work is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nobody is going to leave the farm crew not not understanding how uh, meaningful it can be to, to see something get shaped with your, with your thought and with your labor. Um, and, and, you know, I think while we are excited and we love to promote the students who have gone on into the agricultural world and are making big contributions, it certainly is a big part of what we're doing is just, hey, it is cool to be able to come back here in 20 years and say, I built that fence, you know, mm-hmm. and, and understand mm-hmm. what went into that and and have an appreciation for the other fences you're going to see, you know, just those little things that, um, that make the day uh, spent in the field meaningful. Um, certainly we have a number of students that that's, that's just going to be their biggest takeaway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. What are you looking forward to over the next couple of years of really building or working on with the farm? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You know, I still feel new, um, in some ways, I was I, since I started right as COVID hit, I mm-hmm. I got uh, thrown in the deep end in a in a fun way that uh, in some ways I feel new and in some ways I feel like I've been here a while because of it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's such a fun system. It's such a complex system um, that that you know f- previous folks who have gotten to steer the ship have built. Um, but I think one of the things we are really excited about and are, are really focused on is trying to bring some more of those, the soil health principles into our operation. Mm-hmm. Um, we do okay. have a really unique rotation currently 
uh, where we are corn, barley, and then three years of a perennial forage, cool season forage. Um, but it is very tillage heavy uh, and, and really relies on sort of like the old organic principles around um, tillage for uh, certainly for weed control and for, uh, you know, crop termination and that kind of thing. And so we're really trying to think through, okay, can we, can we keep to some of those principles around, um, you know, some of those organic principles? And we're not certified organic at this point. Um, it might be a goal we want to shoot for one day. Um, but, you know, how, how do we bring in some of the new, or, you know, some of the ideas that have really caught the attention of a lot of the agricultural world about around soil health um, and, and, and bring some of those no-till and some of those cover crop principles into the operation um, so, and certainly with a focus on, you know, what does our carbon cycle look like and, and, you know, are we, are we making, um, gains in our carbon holding capacity? So we've got, you know, our efforts on the farm are really focused on making some of those no-till moves. We also have been doing some fairly deep core carbon sampling to set a baseline, um, for where, uh, where our, you know, soil carbon content is. So that as we move into implementing some of these new practices, we can tell, hey, is this having the effect that we'd like to have? Yeah. Um, and then certainly along with that, you know, the, the exciting and, and, and challenging thing is when you make a little tweak like that, and then not a little tweak necessarily, it's going to have implications into our other enterprises. And so, you know, how does our cattle operation, how does our cattle rotation change when we, um, you know, don't have tillage involved, um, you know, where do our cows overwinter, um, you know, what, what sort of forages can we bring in that we don't currently in order to, you know, speed up some of our finishing or optimize some of our finishing of our beef, um, you know, how do pigs fit into that system? Um, so those, those questions just sort of trickle all the way through, um, and we're just kind of constantly wrestling with them. We've kind of got starting to get our toe in the door and, and really mm -hmm. excited about kind of how that's all going to unfold. Um, and, I, and, you know, there certainly is some no-till in the region. Um, and so I think there's some other producers we can learn from, and hopefully we can get some new ideas going as well, um, you know, for those for, for those really, even, even the larger landholders in this region are still small land, you know, uh, eight cropping acres comparatively. Mm -hmm. So how does, you know, how do some of these principles fit into these little um, river valleys and that kind of thing of Appalachia? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what do you think is, um, what do you think is the future of agriculture? No, oh, my I know, goodness. I know that's a huge, <laughs> broad question. <laughs> I guess it's a little bit hard for me to say from, from my vantage point. I think clearly, um, you know, there are, there are things that have captured the non-agricultural mind around food and food production. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, there's been some, uh, you know, you can kind of start with Michael Pollan or, or somewhere around there or, and, and folks who have sort of brought some of these ideas into the public. And, you know, then we kind of come forward with some of the documentaries that have come out recently. Um, and I think all that is interesting. I, I will say, I feel personally a little skeptical of that, of the, um, you know, consumer driven turn at this point. I think it's been a while of us um, thinking that we are going to convince everybody to buy differently and, and that's all going to change things. I hope that we have some more um, broad based and sort of coalition building that we're willing to do. I really like, um, you know, I think some of these organizations that are trying to bring more farmers and, and uh, together and think more systemically about things is something that I get a little bit more excited about. Um, so I hope that some of, of those efforts and, and, and our ability to think a little bit bigger than just like convincing an individual person to like buy a different product. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that's where the future is. If we really want to see some of these bigger changes happen. Um, I, you know, I really don't think we're just going to, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, by you can kind of do the, the moral buying thing our way out of these big problems that we have. And and I, I am hopeful that there are, you know, um, organizations that are trying to make some of those bigger uh, systemic questions get answered. And, and you know, and we have students here and um, that we see who are, you know, also thinking, you know, what are the models and where are the ways that we can, um, you know, move move the ball 
in, in a way that hasn't been, um, you know, tried recently here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. To wrap up, what is your favorite farming tool? Oh my goodness. Well, we do, we have a, uh, ongoing conversation about, um, you know, channel loss versus vice grips around here. I'm a big channel loss person. <laughs> uh, okay. But I, I guess I, so one of the things I don't get to do much here, but that I love doing is probably my favorite farming activity is, is I shear sheep. Um, okay. And so I would have to say, you know, my sheep shearing lead is about my, my favorite farm tool. I, I used to do a lot more of that. I love going around to other farms and, and getting to meet their animals and seeing how, the, you know, different people, um, you know, manage their herd. Um, and so I'd, I'd probably go with that personally, even though it's not a, a tool I'm pulling out as much as I used to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, working with a good a tool that does its job in a great way yeah, is totally always, cool. is always, yeah, it's just a pleasure to do the job because you have the right tools for it. Absolutely. So. Well, Blair, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate you sharing about that and uh, what you guys are doing there at Warren Wilson College. It's uh, very cool. And I do get to Asheville once in a while. So um, yeah, if I'm ever in the area, I will try to get in there and check it out. Please do. We'd love to show you around. And uh, thanks again for having me on. Absolutely. This episode is sponsored by Rimmel Greenhouse Systems, makers of quality greenhouse structures. Whether you're just getting started or buying your 10th tunnel, Rimmel has a structure to fit your needs. I've purchased and grown in Rimmel houses and would recommend them to everyone. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.